All right. Okay, get started here. Um, the Vesper Lab yesterday. Did that, did that help being able to visualize them a little bit, being able to play with them in 3D, kind of make sense kind of what those shapes look like as opposed to just seeing the drawings? Yeah. Um, and hopefully with a little bit of luck, and if you've been, if you uh, keep, keep at it, then it shouldn't really take that much to be able to have those names of those, um, those geometries down and at least the process, which does, at least for me, it always kind of made it made the whole idea of Lewis dot structures make more sense. Um, the reason what we do Lewis dot structures partly is so that we can predict the shapes of the molecules. Um, and then today, after we talk about solutions and concentration a little bit, we'll get into um, polarity, which is a macros a property that has macroscopic effects that we can see in everyday life that's dependent on. Um, Vesper geometries and therefore Lewis dot structures. Uh, have you guys talked at all about polar molecules? So you kind of you kind of need both Lewis dot structures and Vesper geometries before polarity can really make any sort of sense. Um, so that's you know we're we're sort of building up to things that actually have you know occur in the real world and have impact in the real world. Um, and we're going to continue to do that as we move on um, and yeah um, let's see I'm making sure that the um, hydrates lab has a place to submit it I believe it does but the default for whatever reason is still um, that it doesn't have a place to submit it online. So I'll check on that while you guys are working on some practice problems in a minute, but thank you for reminding me, Min. All right. So let's do a quick review. When we're talking about um, matter, remember we started out one of the, some of the first couple topics that we talked about were um, how do you know if it's an element or a compound, if it's a pure substance or if it's a mixture, right? And then we kind of just left mixtures alone for a little bit. And we said, okay, well, here's how pure compounds work. Here's how you can tell an element from a compound. Um, but let's, we're going to go back to talking about mixtures now. What was the difference between a mixture and a compound? Jay? So a compound, you need a chemical reaction for things to happen. And a mixture, things aren't chemically bound together. So you can undo it. You can unmix them relatively easily. But the other part about a compound versus a mixture is kind of related. If it's not, if they're not chemically bound together in any certain ratio, are you stuck just using one ratio of say hydrogen to oxygen? And we could, the, one, of the, one of the ways we could tell if something was a mixture or not is if you could change what the ratio was, right? If it's always two hydrogens to one oxygen, no matter what you do, it's two hydrogens to one oxygen, that's probably a compound. But if you can mix, mix it differently so that you have more oxygen or so that it's a one and a half to one ratio, then all of a sudden it's probably not a pure compound if it can have more than one possible ratio, um, which, okay. So that's a way to tell if it's compound, uh, if it's a compound or a mixture. If we do have a mixture though, and we wanna describe how much we have of that mixture, is it a, enough to just say, okay, I've got a mixture of H2O and NaCl. If I'm trying to give somebody instructions how to make a specific solution. Is that enough right there? If I just said, 
oh, you're gonna, you need to make this solution. It's got salt and water. Is that enough to make to make it your, yourself? You could qualitatively get it right. You can take a handful of salt and some water and mix it together, right? But if you're trying to mix it in any sort of quantitative way, meaning numbers based, then we need more information, right? What information do we need? Percentages, percent what? Yeah, the ratio between the two. So if we we're cooking in the kitchen, that could be like, it, you know, it's a, it's a uh, 10 to one ratio if you're trying to make salt water. For every, for every um, one cup of water, you're gonna use uh, a 10th of a cup of salt or something like that, right? That's, that's a ratio. If we wanted to make that a percentage, what percentage would that be? It was a 10 to one ratio for every 10 cups H2O, use one cup NaCl. It's a 10 to one ratio. What is that as a percentage? 10%. That ten percent NaCl, actually technically this isn't ten percent because it'd be ten out one out of every eleven parts. So it'd be one to nine if you wanted it ten percent. But it's going to be close to ten percent either way. Um, but what I was looking for specifically is by volume. This is ten percent ish, a ten to one ratio by volume. Right, we have to specify our units for this, right? So what does that mean as far as, as quantitatively in the lab? Um, oh, I got these slightly out of order. Um, if we're describing mixtures, we can talk about how dilute they are, how concentrated they are, if it's saturated. Who knows what saturated means? If it's like fully, like absorbed. fully absorbed or to the point where the better way of describing it is it's got so much of something in it that it can't absorb anymore, which is why in pop culture, you hear people talking about the market being saturated. It doesn't mean that you can't make more of something. It just means that people aren't going to buy any more of it, aren't going to absorb any more of it. Um, I would say that the market is saturated when it comes to Marvel at this point, right? It doesn't matter how many more Marvel movies Disney makes. You know, they're not really the, the big deal that they used to be because everybody's kind of just like, I've had enough Marvel for, for a while. Maybe that's just me. I'm saturated on Marvel anyway. And I love Marvel still. Anyway, so saturated in a solution means that. It means that if you add more of something, it won't dissolve anymore. So you can have, so keep adding salt to your solution, but up past a certain point, you'll just have undissolved salt sitting at the bottom of the solution. Um, we talked about numerically how we could describe concentration. And in general, the way we're going to do that is concentration is going to be an amount divided by a volume. Usually, you can describe concentration as an, an amount divided by a mass. Um, but that's a little bit less common because most of the solutions we're going to deal with uh, in labs are going to be liquid based solutions. And so if they're liquid-based solutions, we the easiest way to measure out a liquid is usually by volume. We don't usually weigh liquids out. You can, say, add 100 grams of water to 10 grams of salt, and, do a, and then we would have a ratio by mass instead of by volume. Um, chemistry primarily depends on how many moles of things we have rather than how many grams we have or how many milliliters we have. We usually use molarity as the preferred way of describing uh, a concentration in, in chemistry. Um, and the definition of that is moles per liter. But I'm gonna go back first. Just because we usually think about liquids or uh, sol solutions as being liquid-based, but they don't technically have to be. Any homogeneous mixture is can, can be considered a solution. Um, so the, whatever you have the most of is considered is called the solvent, the thing doing the dissolving. 
And whatever you have less of is called the solute. So the solute is dissolved into the solvent to make a solution. Um, we'll use these terms fairly often when we start getting into talking about, about uh, solutions, especially in lab, but in general, um, solvent gets used a lot, especially in OCHEM when you're talking about these um, properties. Um, but here's just some examples of other types of solutions that you can have a, a solute dissolve, a solid solute dissolved in a liquid solvent. That's our salt water example. You can have a gas dissolved in a liquid. That's still a solution, right? Um, example would be carbonation. Um, another example. It would be um, if you've ever if you've ever drank water that's been boiled and then cooled back down, it doesn't taste very good, right? Um, that's actually because you've driven off all of the gases, the nitrogen and oxygen that are naturally dissolved in tap water at room temperature, um, and that those help make it taste better to your tongue. Um, if you drive off all of the gases that are dissolved in the water by heating it up to boiling and then letting it cool back down, and if you don't give it enough time to reabsorb some of the, the um, oxygen, it just doesn't taste as good to most people. I'm sure there are some people that like the taste of boiled water. Um, I'm not one of them. Um, liquid dissolved in a liquid. That happens all the time, too. Anytime you've got an alcohol, um, an alcohol-based drink, it's ethanol dissolved in water of, of any sort. And in fact, the, the perfect beverage actually is a, has a liquid solvent that has solid liquid and gas dissolved in it, if you ask me. Um, if you think about, or I guess soda works too. Um, I was thinking about beer, but... Um, Beer has got ethanol and CO2 and a little bit of sugar dissolved in it, um, which is, you know, a very tasty beverage. Coca-Cola doesn't have a liquid liquid solution. I don't think there are any ingredients of, of most sodas that are liquid on their own when they're pure. But it would be a solid dissolved in a liquid and a gas dissolved in uh, Gas dissolved in a gas. Atmosphere is an example of that. You can't really have liquids dissolved in a in a gas. Um, I can't, at least I can't think of a case where you could possibly have a gas solvent with a liquid dissolved in it and have it be homogeneous. You can have a heterogeneous mixture of liquid dissolved in a gas um, and see that all the time in meteorology. It's heterogeneous. What's a liquid that could be considered dissolved into a gas solute? A cloud. Yeah. Cloud technically is liquid because it's little droplets of water and suspended in a gas solvent. It's not homogeneous, though, because you don't have uniform clouds, cloud cover around the entire world. Um, and then I, just to bring back to our hydrates lab, Hydrates are an example of a liquid dissolved in a solid, which is a little bit weird to think about. We don't think of solids as being a solvent very often. That can happen. Um, or alloys are an example of a solid dissolved in another solid. You have to dissolve them. You have to make the solution when they're liquids, but then when it cools back down, you still have a, a homogeneous distribution of um, solute dissolved in a solid. All right. Anybody think of any other examples or have any questions about where a specific example would fit in here? I'm always interested in hearing what everybody else has to say or what, what you're thinking about it. Some good, I and mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward, right? The idea of a homogenous mixture is something we've been talking about for a while, or we talked about a while ago, at least. It's not particularly tricky. All right, so if we have a concentration, concentration is just going to be the way we, we measure how much, um, how much of a solute is dissolved in a solution.
Um, and again, the most common one is moles per liter. And more specifically, molarity, which the unit for we use capital M, is defined as moles of solute per liter of solution. So as long as you know how many, it's a lot like density in a lot of ways, right? Except um, whereas density would be an amount in grams per volume, molarity is an amount in moles per volume. Capital M as a unit is molarity. So if we said 0 0.425 capital M, that means for every one liter of solution, there are 0 0.425 moles of solute. Which means just like density, this is another conversion. All concentration units are basically just another way we can use a conversion, right? Because anytime you have a concentration unit, it's going to be an amount divided by a volume, usually sometimes the mass. But if it's a percent by mass, that's a conversion too, right? If I said something was 32%, let's say sugar, I say soda is 32% sugar by mass. How can we use that as a conversion factor? What does this unit really mean in terms of a way we could we could do some math with it? Yeah, so you could say if it's percent, per always means for every, right? So if we said moles per liter for every one liter, that's this many moles, right? If it's percent, what does cent mean? What's the root of cent? C-E-N-T. A hundred, century. Yeah, same thing, right? So you can either say for every 100 grams of soda, is 32 grams of sugar. So that allows, and it, you can divide both sides by 100 and get for every one gram of soda is 0.32 grams of sugar. Mathematically, that'll work out to be the same though, right? If we wind up using this as a conversion, we either have it set up like this, so 100 to 32 or one to 0.32, we just don't need to divide by 100 then. All right, so if we're trying to find molarity, just like finding density, that's not all that complicated necessarily. We just need to figure out how many moles we have of something per liter of solution per, and then find the total volume in liters. And we can always just plug it in and do the math. So let's do some practice. So let's say for this, this particular example, um, somebody has their blood drawn and it's measured that there's 0.195 grams of cholesterol and there's the formula for cholesterol in 0 0.100 liters of serum. What's the concentration of cholesterol in molarity? How do we go about finding that? We just need moles of solute, right? And we're gonna put liters on bottom. So use the molecular weight, right? We've been practicing using grams to get to moles. This is no different. Zero point one nine five grams of cholesterol. So let's see. That's going to give us twenty. I'm not going to do twenty seven times twelve in my head. What do we get? 
101. Is that just for the carbons or is that seems a little low because 12 times 10 is 120, right? Oh, did you do the math? Did you do 0.1 that times? Divided by, no. 386 point, say it one more time, Jacob. 638 is one mole of cholesterol out of number six. I figured if I just kept going, someone would correct me. If you want to get people to participate in something, the number one thing you can do is write something wrong on the board or put it up on the screen because everybody likes to correct something, right? All right, so that gives us moles of cholesterol then. So we're going to get a pretty small number. What do we get? Point, point 0.195 divided by 400. And how many sig figs do we need to keep? Three, so give me two more sig figs. Do we need to do anything with, with the volume, the solution? It's already in liters. If it gave it to us in milliliters or gallons or cups or something like that, we might have to do a little bit of conversions to get our volume into liters. We do need per one liter. So the way we're going to do that is take our amount, our moles, 504 moles divided by 0 0.100 liters. If you just do this division, you'll get per liter. That does put it for one liter. And the shorthand for saying what we're finding the molarity of, we still want to use that capital M as our unit. Um, but if you're trying to say concentration of a specific solute, use square brackets. So concentration of cholesterol is 0 0.000504 moles over 0.1 liters or 5.04 times 10 to the minus three because we're going to wind up divide by 0.1 the same as multiplying by 10 right so we're going to multiply this by 10 move it which moves the decimal one spot and then i just put it in scientific notation because i don't like having big long numbers with a bunch of zeros before but it would be just as correct to write 0 0.00504, capital M. All right, so nothing inherently tricky here. We, you just need to be able to find moles and liters. If you're given liters, that's pretty straightforward. If you're not, you might have to do some conversions. All right, let's one on the next slide. I think it was the next. All right, let's do B. Uh, let's do C. 1.49 kilograms of isopropyl alcohol in 2.5 liters of solution. So this is rubbing alcohol. The way you buy it at the store, it's actually a solution of isopropyl alcohol with water. We want to find out what the molarity is. Turn kilograms of isopropyl into moles, divide by 
So where do we start? We want concentration of let's see abbreviation for isopropyl. Yeah, oops. C C three H eight O. We just need moles, which we represent with lowercase n, moles of C3H8O divided by liters of solution. So to get moles of C3H8O, take your 1.49 kilograms. Our number one tool for getting the moles is always molecular weight, right? Molarity is gonna be our number, our second option for getting to moles here. So one kilogram, 10 to the three grams, and C3H8O winds up being, is that 60? So we get what about twenty five? We're calling that pretty close. And we're already given our volume in liters, right? So we just plug stuff in and do the division. 24.8 moles divided by 2.5 liters. It's just under 10, right? 2.50 liters, I think it says, right? You good, Maddie? Okay. So we can calculate something. Good for us. Why is it useful to be able to calculate this? Because if we're trying to add something to a chemical reaction, the number one way we have of figuring out how many moles we added is using the mass, right? The other option, if you have a solution with a known concentration, is to do a quick conversion using molarity as a conversion factor to get to from say, how many liters of isopropyl alcohol does it take to provide this many moles of isopropyl alcohol? All right, so we can do that. I made those kind of small. Um, we can do a, I still doesn't like the arrow for this font. Um, pretend that that says that there's a chemical reaction. What's our limiting reactants? In this situation. And I will, let me blow up the numbers so you can see it a little bit better. That doesn't work. Ah. So we have a reaction here. Does this reaction, does this type of reaction seem familiar? A little easier to see anyone. We have, what are our reactants? Magnesium hydroxide and HCl is hydrochloric acid. So we have an acid plus a hydroxide and then we're making water from that. What type of reaction is that? Is it redox? Nope. I see shaking heads. How do we know it's not redox? 
Nothing changes charges. Nothing changes oxidation states. Magnesium's plus two and it's still plus two. Fluoride and it's still fluoride. The oxygen is a minus two to oxidation state on the left. It's still minus two and hydrogen's plus one and plus one. So if it's not redox, our other two options were precipitation or precipitation is when we mix two solutions and we get a solid product. What was the other option if it's not redox? Anybody remember? Acid base. It's an acid reactant. That's your first clue. You've got an acid and it's not a redox reaction. It's probably an acid base reaction. All right. How do we figure out what the limiting reactant is? What's the first step when we do a stoichiometry problem? Very first step is balance. This one I gave it to you balance though. Now it's never a bad idea to double check that I didn't make a mistake. Check. All right, so then put everything in moles. So 5.561 grams, that's pretty easy of magnesium hydroxide because it's just a weight, which means we're going to use our molecular weight, right? Like we've been practicing. For every, I think it's 58. One mole of magnesium hydroxide. Get something a little under, so what, 0 0.09? Sorry, 0.09, 5, 3. Oh, 3, 4. All right, easy enough so far, right? Or at least nothing that you haven't seen before. For the hydrochloric acid, we don't add hydrochloric acid by weighing out how many grams of HCl we have. It's a solution. So what we do have is a concentration in molarity and a volume. So the known concentration of this solution is 0 0.500 moles per liter. And we have 205.2 milliliters that we added. So how many moles is that? How are we gonna figure that out? using the molarity as a conversion factor. Another way of writing 0 0.500 M is for every one liter, there's 0 0.500 moles of HCl. So we set it up so that our volume units cancel out. We have to do a quick conversion to get from milliliters to liters, right? 205.5 two milliliters and for every 10 to the three milliliters is one liter, right? Thousand milliliters is in a liter. Milliliters cancels milliliters, liters cancels liters. We're left in moles of HCl. So 0 0.1 Oh, three. If I did my math right. So it's not really any different when it comes to doing stoichiometry problems than using molecular weight, right? We just have to be given more information. 
if you have a if you have uh, a mass and you have a periodic table, you have everything you need to get to moles, right? If you have a solution, you need a volume and a concentration, but then you can get to moles just by doing some quick conversions that way too, right? So which of these is gonna run out first? This is not a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So we can't just look at it and say, I have less of the magnesium hydroxide, therefore it's getting used up first. So if we're trying to show that, if we think that that magnesium or that our HCL is running out first, to show our work, 0 0.103, moles of HCl, and then we're going to use our stoichiometry coefficients, right? For every two moles of HCl used, that's one mole of MgOH2 used. Right? And we're going to get 0 0.0513. So if we use up all of our acid, we have 0 0.0513 moles of magnesium hydroxide being used. Do we have that? Yes, we do have that because we started with 0 0.09 moles. And I flipped these numbers in my head, which means this last part, I'll skip the theoretical yield part here. Um, what is the concentration of magnesium hydroxide? I meant to have the HCL be the leftover component, but I misjudged things when I was going quickly. What is the concentration of magnesium hydroxide after the reaction? The concentration of HCL is going to be zero because it's the limiting reactant, right? but we're gonna have some leftover magnesium hydroxide, aren't we? We started with 0 0.09 moles of magnesium hydroxide, we used 0 0.05 moles. This is where we're going with that, with the excess reagent part of our, of our theoretical yield. Sometimes we wanna know what the new concentration of something is after a reaction. So in this case, figure out what the excess reagent is and how many moles of it are left over and figure out what that new concentration is. For a sheet for Google, I thought it for less than sign. That that decreases the size of the font. Anyway, that's in Microsoft, and I don't believe it still works in Sheets. It's okay. It doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to fix this so that we're not, everybody's not confused when I say concentration of magnesium hydroxide. The control, uh, greater than not control, shift, just uh, control. All right. Thank you.
There we go. Now that now that we can all be satisfied with the aesthetics here. Um, as just for common knowledge, uh, anytime if I'm replying or if you're trying to write something in uh, your Canvas quiz or if I'm trying to write you a comment, in the comments doesn't support doing subscripts and superscripts, although I'll have to try these new keyboard shortcuts, but I don't think that that'll work in Canvas. So a lot of times what you might see me write is MG OH underscore two underscore, just like caret means exponent, underscore means subscript if you're doing it in, in shorthand. So anyway, what's our new concentration of magnesium hydroxide? Well, our new concentration of, of MgOH2 is equal to the moles, the excess moles divided by the volume of the solution. So how many moles excess did we have? What we started with minus what we used, right? Just like we've done excess reagent in the past. We have this much and we use this much. If we had 17 hamburger patties and we used 13 of them, what's our excess hamburger patties? It's the difference between the two, right? So 0 0.04 4 0. Did I do that right? I didn't have to do any borrowing, so usually I can do subtraction in my head, okay, if I don't have to borrow anything. Zero, four, four, zero moles. What do we do for volume of the solution? Why would you think that? Walk me through your logic. I'm not saying you're wrong. We're adding a solid to a, something that's already a water-based solution, right? If you add a handful of salt to a pot of water, what's the volume of your solution? The volume of the water, right? So in this case, the volume of the solution is 205.2 milliliters. Generally speaking, adding a, dissolving a solid in a liquid solution doesn't change the volume of the solution, which is weird, but it turns out that's a pretty good assumption until you get to things that are, that are close to the saturation point. But in general, the volume is going to be the same within sig figs. Um, mostly because when you dissolve something in, in, in water, you actually wind up with it being a little bit more tightly packed than it was before. There's inherently little gaps in between the water molecules that the ions can sit in and it doesn't really increase the overall, overall volume. In fact, if you take, you, if you measure out 50 milliliters of water and 50 milliliters of ethanol, um, if you measure it out really closely to the you know plus or minus a 10th of a milliliter, when you mix them together, you get 98 milliliters of solution which is weird. Seems like that's violating conservation of mass, right? But the densities changed. It's not that the mass changed, the mass will be the same before and after you mix them, but the densities are different. And that means the volume can be the different, even if the mass of the two parts has to equal the sum or the mass of the mixture has to be the sum of the two parts. So, 
would we say 205.2 milliliters. We want that in liters. So divide by a thousand. The point of what I was getting at with all that is anytime we're making a solution, the volume of the solution is the same as the volume of the solute or the solvent. We're just not, we're not going to take into account um, that there might be small fluctuations because it's good enough within sig figs. If we have a reaction that happens because we mixed two solutions, the new volume is the sum of the two solutions, which also kind of makes sense, right? We're not going to worry about the little bit that might be off if it's two different solvents. So take our new con our new number of moles divided by our volume. What do we get for an answer? So our molarity of magnesium hydroxide is 0.214. The way you say this as a unit, you can just say M, but usually you say molar, M-O-L-A-R, like your tooth. So we'd say it's 0.214 molar. So concentrations are a pain sometimes, but if you get everything in terms of moles per liter, then concentration is really easy to use. The problem is, and again, once again, I'm gonna throw um, biologists under the bus here. Um, a lot of times lab procedures, especially in biology labs, will have you prepare solutions based on a percent by volume. So it'll be, or it'll be, you'll see something written as percent mass over volume. What that means is they're giving you really, easy, if I said something was 15, 15.5, 15 percent mass over volume, that's really easy to make that solution because I weigh out 15.5 grams of whatever the solute is, and then I just add enough water to make it 100 milliliters. Or, um, yeah, 100 milliliters. So that's easy for lab prep. It's not so easy for figuring out calculations like stoichiometry calculations because we don't want mass per volume. We want moles per volume. We're going to skip this one for now so we can talk about polarity. Uh, we might have time to come back to that one. But if you have a percent by mass and we want to put it into moles, it's pretty similar to what we described earlier is for percent by volume. If you have percent by mass, you can say, okay, for every 100 grams of this compound, I have 75 grams of carbon. If I have 75 grams of carbon, how many moles is that? Basically, if you're trying to start from a percentage to figure out a new concentration or what the formula is, just say, I'm going to assume I'm starting with 100 grams. And use that to, if I have 100 grams, how many grams of carbon do I have? How many moles of carbon do I have? All right. Questions about concentration before we move on to something less number-based and more conceptual. Going once, twice, moving on to polarity. All right. When we talk about formal charge for a Lewis dot structure, we assume that the electrons are being shared evenly, right? That's what allows us to say, okay, well, it has half of the electrons half the time when it comes to figuring out formal charge. But when we talked about oxidation states, we said, well, yeah, but really we're just gonna say that whatever's the, the bigger bully out of the group gets to control the electrons entirely. The truth is really kind of halfway in between the two. The truth is, is that if you have two different atoms, atoms of a different element sharing electrons in a covalent bond, they're pretty much always shared unevenly. So whatever is more electronegative 
is better at pulling electrons towards itself. And so what you really get when you, when we have one of these bonds is we get We get something that looks like pull this figure up so we can see it better. Something that looks more like this. So if it's a true ionic bond, you have an electron actually changing hands. Right, where you get wind up with your sodium gives away its electron entirely to a chlorine that so becomes chloride. If you have a covalent bond between two of the same atom, you get these electrons being shared evenly. You wind up with sort of this hybrid um, orbital that looks kind of like the two atomic orbitals that are around. If you have two different nuclei sharing electrons, Usually, you're going to have a situation that looks more like this. Usually, you're going to have a situation where one side has more of the electrons than the other side. They're still in both valences, so it still counts as a covalent bond for this purpose of filling both atoms' valences. But they're not being shared evenly. All right, so, and the way we indicate that, it's kind of a little bit hard to see. From, from way back, uh, but the sign, we use a, a Greek symbol to indicate that's a partial charge. So this is a lowercase delta, um, not the same lowercase delta that you use in calculus if you're doing partials, um, but it's the same root. You know that we're in trouble when we start running out of Greek letters, uppercase and lowercase, and so we start using the secondary form of lowercase Greek letters. So if you're taking a partial derivative of something, you do a lowercase delta that looks like this, like change in X with respect to change in Y. But to indicate that we're talking about charge, not talking about a, a calculus differential, we use this form of delta in chemistry. This just means that there's kind of a charge we can't really deal with partial charges in terms of actually counting atoms, right? We're counting electrons and protons. We deal entirely with whole charges, right? This is basically a way of saying, well, there's all the electrons are there, but they're kind of smeared out this way. There's extra electrons on one side and we're missing electrons on the other side. Both atoms can still have a full valence though. All right. And the thing that makes this tricky is it turns out that we've been treating covalent bonds and ionic bonds like it's either or. It's a binary choice. It's either an ionic bond or it's a covalent bond. Technically, it's more like a spectrum. The bigger the difference in electronegativity between the two nuclei, the more unevenly the electrons are shared. And we just have some sort of arbitrary cutoffs um, where we'll say, okay, well, if the difference in electronegativity is between zero and 0.4, then we're going to say that that's a nonpolar bond, that it's, they're being shared more or less evenly. If it's between, if the difference between the two atoms is between 0.4 and 1.8, then we're going to call that a covalent bond, but it's a polar covalent bond. And then above 1.8, we're going to call that a pure ionic bond. Really, even that's not a hard limit, right? There, um, which is why different textbooks, some of them say 1.8, some of them say 2.0. What I'm more most interested in is can you understand that it's not a binary choice that is a spectrum between completely covalent and completely ionic, right? What's our old criteria? How did, when we're doing the nomenclature packet, how did we remember, to, um, or how did we decide what was covalent and what was ionic? If I said MgCl2, how did we decide that, whether that was covalent or ionic? Yeah, metals, 
We said if we had a metal and a non-metal, that was enough to say it's an ionic bond. Technically, that's not true. It's a good approximation. Most times that you have a metal and a non-metal, it'll be above that 1.8 threshold. So if we look at the, at the electronegativity of magnesium, it's 1.2. These are in weird unitless numbers. They're called degrees Pauling um, after, after the Linus Pauling. Um, if we want to know if it's a covalent bond or not, really what we should do is say, okay, well, magnesium's got electronegativity of 1.2, chlorine has 3.0. 3 so the difference in electronegativity is 3.0 minus 1.2. So the difference in electronegativity between the two of them is going to be what defines it as ionic, covalent, or polar. So this one winds up being right on the threshold, right? It's, for the most part, for naming purposes, for nomenclature purposes, we'd, we're still gonna call that ionic. As far as understanding what the bonds actually look like, it's really gonna look like something kind of in between these two where the electrons are being shared, but not very even. All right. How does this apply to anything? Well, I guess we'll, we'll practice assigning whether something is covalent, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. So this one we classify as ionic. It's at that 1.8 threshold. What about if we had the molecule CH2Cl2? How do we know if that has polar bonds in it? First, we have to know what's attached to what, don't we? So where are we going to start? From the beginning? Lewis dot structures. Do a Lewis dot structure first, and we can see what's attached to what. And then we can say, oh, I'm, I've got these two atoms are attached together. Is that covalent or is that polar? So start by arranging your atoms. You can. You can start by adding the um, eight electrons in before we even count everything up if you wanted to, since we know that they're all going to be attached at some point. Um, we get a total of two times seven electrons plus two times one electron for the hydrogens plus one carbon with four electrons. So 14, 16, and four is 20 electrons total, right? Valence electrons. Making those first four bonds. We're down to 12 left. Where do they need to go? Carbon's good, hydrogens are good. Chlorines each need six more. So there's our Lewis dot structure. Are there any polar bonds in this molecule? Are there any bonds where they're not being shared evenly that meet our, our cutoff criteria? Let me go back to the slide where I have that blown up a little bit more. You can see the numbers. Well, we have a couple possible combinations, right? We have a couple different types of bonds here. We have a carbon hydrogen bond, and then we have a carbon chlorine bond. Is the carbon hydrogen bond a polar bond? It's right at that cutoff, right? 2.1 for hydrogen and 2.5 for carbon. 
In fact, that's actually the way that I remember that that cutoff is at 0.4 is because carbon and hydrogen is almost our, our definition of nonpolar compounds are going to be that they're entirely carbon and hydrogen. Um, so that anything that's more polar than carbon and hydrogen is a polar bond, but carbon and hydrogen is not nonpolar. So these bonds are nonpolar. What about carbon to chlorine? 2.5 to 3.0, the difference of 0.5, right? So these ones are polar. Do we have to compare chlorine to hydrogen? Why not? Yeah, they're not attached. They don't have any bonds. This is, that's why the lewis dock structure winds up being important, because otherwise you don't know what bonds you need to be looking at if you don't know what bonds are in the molecule. All right. The rule of thumb, if you don't have this table in front of you, for one, one, I'm going to give you this. This table of electronegativity values is on your equation sheet, your periodic table. So I'm going to give it to you on your test. Um, so you don't need to have it memorized. If you don't have these values in front of you, the easy way to remember it is that your four most electronegative elements are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Anything that's not one of those that's bound to any one of those four is going to be a polar bond, if not an outright ionic bond. Anything, if you have two non-metals that are connected that are not one of those four, they're, for the most part, they're pretty close in terms of electronegativity. Um, so that's going to be a non-polar, usually. There's some, some extreme cases, which is why I give you the values. All right, so why does this matter? Well, because if you have polar bonds where the electrons are not being shared evenly, you can wind up with entire molecules that are polar where the electrons are not being shared evenly. If you have polar bonds and you have an asymmetric shape, this is where we bring Vesper geometries into it too. If you have polar bonds in the molecule and it has an asymmetric shape, we say that that's a polar molecule. And polar molecules are relevant because being a polar molecule or how polar a molecule is determines a lot of things like melting point and boiling point, determines what will dissolve in that particular liquid. Uh, if you want to understand why, why oil and water don't mix, it has to do with the fact that water is polar and oil is not. Right, And so a lot of real world molecular behavior is dependent on how polar a molecule is. Um, and when I say asymmetric shape, we'll, we'll do some practice with that. Polar bonds, if you know how to do your Lewis dot structure, figuring out polar bonds is not that tricky, right? Especially if you have a table of electronegativities in front of you. Understanding what it means by an asymmetric shape is a little trickier. So an asymmetric shape means that you have to have a net pull towards one side of the molecule. So for instance, carbon to oxygen, that's a polar bond. But the two oxygens that are pulling on the electrons are exactly opposite from each other. They're pulling in exactly opposite directions. So even though each of these is a polar bond, the molecule as a whole is nonpolar because those polar, those electronegative oxygens are fighting with each other and kind of canceling each other out. In order for it to be a polar molecule, you need a polar bond and a way to pull more of the electron density to one side than the other. 
the analogy I like to use with these polar bonds is it's like playing tug of war. Uh, so if you have chlorine, more electronegative, bigger, stronger, playing tug of war with hydrogen, it's going to pull the electrons towards itself, right? If you have oxygen playing tug of war with carbon, it's going to pull the electrons. But really, if you have oxygen playing tug of war with another oxygen, it's not going to move as much. So in our tug of war analogy, oxygen is like an NFL team. Carbon's like a high school football team. And hydrogen's like a peewee football team, right? If you have this situation with NFL team, NFL team, and a high school team stuck in the middle, nothing's really going to happen, right? Because it's really the two NFL teams playing tug of war with each other, and the high school team is just along for the ride, especially our high school team, right? You soon? Sorry, I had a high school team like that too. Um. <laughs> Everybody's paying attention though. That's good. All right. So, how do we decide if something has an asymmetric shape? We use the Vesper geometries, which means Lewis dot structures, right? So, to do this, you need to know the Lewis dot structures. And you need to be able to do the Vesper geometries. And then from there, when we have the molecular geometry, you need at least one thing attach to that center atom that's not identical to the other things attached to it. So you need to have polar bonds and we need that asymmetric geometry. So let's start by doing Lewis dot structures and figuring out the molecular geometries and which ones even have polar bonds. And then we'll look at which geometries are polar. So carbon tetrachloride, that one's actually pretty, pretty easy compared one we just did, right? Same thing, basically. Lone pairs on the central atom do affect it. And we'll talk about why in a second. So what are what's our Lewis thought structure for the top one going to look like? CH2O, formaldehyde. What's going to go in the middle? Carbon. Count up all your electrons. After you get, after you distribute all your electrons and satisfy oxygen, you'll realize you still need an extra pair on carbon. So we make a double bond to the carbon. Does this molecule have any polar bonds? Which one or ones? Carbon to oxygen. Oxygen's one of our big bullies, right? Then we have carbon, carbon to hydrogen is nonpolar, but we have a polar bond at least. What's the molecular geometry of the carbon? Trigonal planar. It's flat, right? Is this molecule symmetric? Depends on how you define symmetry, right? Yeah. It's symmetric from left to right, but it's not symmetric top to bottom. And top to bottom is where that polar bond is, right? So is there one half of this molecule we would expect to have a partial negative? Yeah. Which part? Oxygen. The oxygen is going to have extra electrons around it because it's more electronegative than the carbon. It's better at pulling electrons towards itself, which means the bottom half is going to be a partial positive. relative to each other. So Lewis dock st structure for carbonate looks like this. Still trigonal planar, right? Yeah. 
but now we have three polar bonds all pointed in exactly opposite directions, right? So this one carbonate has polar bonds, but does not have asymmetry, right? Because if this oxygen is playing tug of war with this oxygen and this oxygen, and they're all 120 degrees from each other, they're all gonna cancel each other out, right? So it's playing tug of war in two dimensions now rather than just in a straight line. It's the same idea as our CO2 molecule from the last slide. So this molecule overall is a polar molecule because it has polar bonds and it has asymmetry. It's trigonal planar shape, but two of the things attached to that center atom are not the same as the other. That's our definition of asymmetry. For this class, it's anytime you have two different things attached to the central atom, with a couple of exceptions, you're gonna wind up with it being asymmetric. So what about carbon tetrachloride? What's our Lewis dot structure look like? Yeah, one carbon with four chlorides around it. Can be a tetrahedral shape. We have because we have three clouds of electrons taking up space around that carbon, or sorry, four clouds of electrons taking up space around that carbon. Does it have polar bonds? We already looked at carbon and chlorine once, right? So carbon to chlorine is a polar bond. Does it have asymmetry? They're all pulling, they're all pulling with the exact same strength. They're just doing it in three dimensions now. So it looks weird to us. But if you turn, if you turn the pull in all of these different directions into forces in the X direction and forces in the Y direction and forces in the Z direction, you're gonna wind up with them totally canceling out. Because these bottom three are all pulling away from each other but they're all also slightly pulling away from the one that's up there, right? So if you add up the force downward from all three of these that are pulling a little bit down, it's gonna be the same as the force pulling straight up. So because it's a symmetric shape, because it's one of our electron geometries, one of our, our primary geometries, and all four of these are the same, this, is a non-polar molecule. It has the polar bonds, but it doesn't have the asymmetry. You need both of those for it to be a polar molecule. Right, and the easy way to think about asymmetry for right now is you need one thing attached to your central atom that's not the same as the rest. If you have one thing attached to your central atom that's not the same as the rest, you don't wind up with all those arrows canceling out, all those forces canceling out. That's what gives us the asymmetry, right? So it's it could be as simple as one hydrogen here. Now, these chlorines are all still mostly canceling each other out, right? But they're all pulling slightly up into the right. If they're all pulling slightly up into the right, and there's no chlorine over here to counteract that, then we have asymmetry, right? So it just takes one thing attached to that central atom to not be the same as the rest. And we have asymmetry. So then is there, there's only symmetry if it's two types of atoms. In the simplest cases, it's gonna be, if you have all of, oh, I guess you can't even say that because if there's a lone pair, a lone pair counts too, right? So let's let's look at the next one. NH, last one, NHCl2. Do we have polar bonds? 
Which one? Or ones? Hydrogen to nitrogen is polar. Nitrogen to chlorine, they are almost the same electronegativity. Those are nonpolar. But nitrogen to hydrogen is polar. And we have asymmetry. And in fact, we would still have asymmetry if they were all hydrogens. Because the nitrogen is pulling electron density from all of the hydrogens towards itself, and that's not counteracting that pull. So this has asymmetry too, even though it's only two types of atoms. All right, don't forget to take your quiz this weekend. I did put up the, um, the submit button for the hydrates lab. And since I forgot to do it till today, you don't have to turn it in. You have till Sunday to turn in the, the hydrates lab. But do it before you forget about it. H2. There's only there's only one. There's but they're both the same strength. Okay. Then so they're both pulling equally. So there's no polar bonds. So it's not. Yeah. Okay. 